Welcome back to the Street Parking Podcast. Today is another fun episode with one of our amazing members. I'm super excited about this one, uh, who is here to do the vault with us. And earlier today, she got to do the vault workout with Molly, but we're not going to talk about that because at the time that this is released, that has not yet been released. Uh, but she did the workout earlier with Molly. We've known her for a long time. This is not the first time we've met, but it's the first time having her here, Ms. Leanne Roach. And you might know her as Lanny Lifts on Instagram, is here with us today. And I'm so excited. Like, there's so many things I want to talk to you about. And I'm just, I'm oh, I was so glad to see that you're one of the people that was coming in this group. Yeah, I'm so pumped up to be here. It's so great. Uh, okay, so we can't give away what your workout was, but you did it with Molly. How mm -hmm. did it go? It was amazing. <laughs> For those of you like only listening to the audio version, yeah. you did not get the facial expression that went along with that. Um, I mean, but how can you say, I mean, Molly's just like, that's a lot of pressure. Right, and she's you know, so fit. She she like <laughs> she calls us endurance buddies, and I'm like, yeah, we're so. Oh yeah, she was really we're, excited we're about so that. So comparable, you're right. So. Yeah, same same. But she's been a big supporter of endurance for me, and you know, always talks to me through it. So it's been great. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, if you could describe the workout without giving it away in like one or two words, deceiving. Okay, I agree with you on that one actually, because yeah, I looked at your workout yesterday and I was like, well, that one looks kind of fun. Like, ah, mm -hmm. oh, Molly, I'm jealous, kind of. Um, yeah. But not if you do it correctly. Right. If you do it correctly, as with all the workouts, it can look so simple. Right. And you're just destroyed. Actually, the more simple it looks, usually the worse. 100%. We've learned. Yeah. Um, so Leanne is an assistant principal, mm -hmm. 44 years old, mom of two uh, boys, mm -hmm. and wife. Yes. To an amazing woman who is just, I was telling her that, I, or telling you that I'm sad that she's not here because she's hilarious. Yeah. And she came to Vegas and became the star of the show while you guys were working out because she brought posters and it's just a ball of energy. Right. And we joy. Joke, um, if you can't be an athlete, be an athletic supporter. Yeah, that's what she would say. <laughs> so that's her. hundred uh, She could be her. an athlete. Though. She sure could. But yeah. I mean, her the attitude is there. Yeah. She just does not like to be encouraged, talked to, just leave her alone. Oh, she doesn't like to be encouraged? No. Because she's the biggest encourager I've ever seen. 100%. The, if we ever work out together, we're not allowed. I'm not allowed to look at her, talk to her, anything. That's so funny. So she does do it sometimes with you. Yes, she has done. She has done a few. She is an official member. Okay. So, yeah, we're working on What's it. it tell, remind me what her name is. Whitney. Whitney. She's yes. the best. The yeah. best. She's so great. But super pumped to have you here. Um, where do I even start? Okay, so you joined street parking in January of 2019, mm -hmm. so four years you've been in right now. Right. And I think you're pretty, I mean, you're pretty active on social media, yeah. more on Instagram than Facebook, but you use both. Right, right. What were you doing before you found street parking? So Fitness-wise, yeah, obviously. No, yeah, so Not I had life. gone, uh, when we, I'm from a small town, and there was one CrossFit box there. Um, just wasn't a great fit for me. So when I moved to Fort Worth, Texas, I was like, I'm going to find the one, right? Because there's tons of options. So many there. And so <clears throat> tried a couple, wasn't great, finally settled on one. And I was literally a member there for about a month. And I was like, this is just... What is it? So when everybody's different, obviously, right? And I think yeah. that's one thing that's cool about having options for different gyms or programs or whatever. What was it that you were looking for that you didn't find? Community. Okay. A hundred percent. I just didn't feel like I fit in wherever I went. Mm. So I just, even though I tried a bunch of different places, I just never felt like, you know, I couldn't find a, a class that I wanted to join or a group of people that I could associate with. I just always felt like the odd man out, basically. So even a couple weeks in, you're like, I feel like I don't, I don't still really connect with anyone. Right. You and gotta find, like, you, they gotta be your people. Yeah, 100%. You, there should be inside jokes within a few weeks. Right. And <laughs> to be honest with you, for the price, I was like, this this is just kind of crazy to me. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. So you um, you moved to Texas. When did you move there? No, I'm, I'm from Texas. I'm from a small town. Oh, we moved you moved to, to a Fort different Worth. place yeah, in so Texas. Okay. So my wife could get her PhD. Okay. So, yeah. so you moved to Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. And when was that? That was uh, five years ago. So, so a little over five. So, okay. And then did you find street parking while you were at that gym or did you do your own thing for a while so oddly enough i was a personal trainer okay um before i became oh, an education odd. okay yeah and yeah. you were a police officer I was before a police that officer too. yes okay. i've had like 10 different careers so but here's the thing 
police officer, trainer, principal, like you, you help people. That hundred percent. That's all I want to do yes. is help people. Yeah, for sure. So, well, so we'll dive into that a little yeah. bit more, but we'll figure, well, let's get your origin story within the yeah. SP community here. So I had some equipment at the house in the garage and I'd always wanted to be that like garage warrior or whatever. And I didn't love the box. I came home actually really discouraged from that one mm. day and I was scrolling through Instagram and I don't know who the guy is. I tried to find him, That's but funny. he had like the hashtag and I was like, what, wow. what is this? So I started looking it up and I went inside and I told Winnie, I was like, this is $19 a month. Can I try this? And she was like, what's the catch? And I was like, <laughs> no, really. What kind of supplement program are they going to try to set you up with as yeah. soon as you join? That's so funny. I was like, literally, I think it's $19 a month. I'm going to try for one month and I'm going to see where we go with it. And she's like, yeah, $19 a month. Of course, do it. Yeah. So that was literally it. And I hit it the right time where the control your fitness challenge January. Yes. And all of that. And I think I was actually a member for a week or two before I even really started because I had that, you know, like, this is not really going to pan out. This is going to be like every other program I bought. We hear that so much. Right. And then I think Molly might have reached out to me or someone reached Dang. out to me. And I was like, wait, what, what's the deal with this? <laughs> There's something to this. Why do you care? What do you? Yeah, yeah. That, that was a, why, <laughs> like, is this like a, a bot email Isn't or something? Isn't it so sad that we have to be that way nowadays where it's like no one trusts anyone that's like like even people who are genuinely trying to do good mm -hmm. a lot of times are met with this just level of distrust that we've as humans just grown accustomed to because there are so many things out there that are that but they're just trying to sell you something or they're just trying to get something out of you or collect your information whatever it is right that's so sad that it's that way these yeah, days it's like everybody but wants, it's understandable everybody wants something yes so yeah, that was my first inclination. Okay. So. You know Molly. She's always after. She's yeah. always got an angle. <laughs> yeah, see, she, tri she tricked me. She tricked me into endurance. So she was. She just played the long game. So, yeah. Uh, okay, so she reached out, and then mm -hmm. you finally got started. Right, got started, and then started, obviously, trying to find people who were, you know, doing the same thing I was. So I literally, you know, started searching hashtags, and just, like, I was shocked at the number of people that started requesting me, too. And, like, I was oh, like, yeah. oh, like, these people are like-minded like me and then specifically for me when I started seeing people who look like me I was like oh we might be on to something oh that's cool did you so. start posting your workouts right away because you're pretty active in what you post yeah first day okay posted like a selfie and, and you did that with um were you were you active on social media before you did street parking? Not like, no, not for workouts I mean well a few but nothing like this no. so was it did you do that to try to find other people? Yes, 100%. Okay. Yeah. Because you were still searching for that community. Yeah. So. Okay. Just to find and anybody. using the hashtag. Yep. Because street parking was, I mean, not brand new, but that was, we were like two years in compared to where we are now with number of members and things like that. It wasn't where, you know. Right. Um, we were still piecing everything together with Wattify and, yeah. you know, all I that. I remember doing, I think it was the 15,000 celebration, the 600 yes. calorie on the bike. Mm -hmm. And that was very early on. And I was like, this is so stupid <laughs> and great. <laughs> but everyone's doing it. Yeah, so I got to do it. Everybody's doing it. So, yeah. Yeah, isn't that crazy? So you felt that sense of community really early on, on an online program. Right. It's crazy. And when you tell people, they think you're literally crazy too for Right. And like my wife, my mother, my family, I kept telling <laughs> worried them about you. Yeah, and they were like, this doesn't make any sense. And so I would start showing them pictures and talking about it. And they would be like, like, you really care. And I was like, they really care. Mm -hmm. So that was that was cool. That's cool. Do, who was the first person that you connected with and started be becoming friends with on the you group, know, if you can I, remember? I thought about that a lot. Karen. Okay. Very early on. Jess, Silverman. Yes. Okay. Suffer with friends. Yes. Those are two that like pop out in my mind of really being you know instrumental and making me feel like what I was doing was cool and valuable and so when you say when I saw other people that look like me what do you mean by that so I've struggled with weight my entire life um from a very early age so um you know a lot of times when I went into a CrossFit box people were extremely fit mm -hmm. although I wasn't intimidated you know you don't seem like the type of person that, I mean, you were a police officer. You right. don't seem like yeah. the type of person it, that It wasn't like I don't belong here in that respect, but it's also like, it's very nice to have a conversation with someone who is bigger and struggles and they make you, they take all the pressure away. I also of. think that it can be nice to have somebody who, um, 
when you're in when you're in a program like that, whether it's online or in person, that um, it's one thing to have somebody who is a, a trainer push you and encourage you to do more, and that's valuable for sure. But if you have like a, a like a buddy who's fitness bullying you, it's a little bit different. Like we can do we can do the twenty five pound dumbbells. Oh yeah. And if that person says it. It just hits different than if your coach is saying, I think you can do the 25. That's their job, right. and they're going to do that, and that should be respected and everything. But it is different when you're all, like being bullied by somebody who's on your same level right. to be like, let's both do it. Okay, fine, we'll do it. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. Um, I think that can be valuable. I'm all about the fitness bullying. I'm totally in. The crazier it gets, I'm like, yep, I'm, I'm, I'll just do it. I'm in. Yeah, like the stuff that Molly can get me to do because um, – we used to train together, but now we're both moms. Like if she wasn't a mom and she was trying to do that to me, I'd probably be annoyed. Right. But since we've both been through that transition and everything kind of around the same time, so now it's like, ah, okay, fine, we'll do it. Yeah. You know, it's different. So so looking for people who, who looked like you and you were like, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. I also think that there's something to our community, I, I would say especially early on like when you joined, that it is kind of like a band of misfits mm -hmm. where no, there's a lot of people that are – part of our community who feel like they don't fit in anywhere else. Right, 100%. And even like the Facebook page, I was like, it's so insanely positive. And to me, that's what I needed. You know, there was the, the negative stuff just wasn't there. So it, when you constantly are fed positivity, you, you start to become more positive. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Whenever I'm like struggling with like, what are we doing? Are we doing a good job? Like, I'll, I'll just go to our Facebook group and just read it for a little bit. And within a few, a handful of posts, you'll just be like, okay, this is important. What we're doing, we got to keep going, you know? Right. Um, and I'm sure you felt the same way of like, okay, I'm going to do my workout and I'm going to post it because it might, it might encourage somebody else Yep. who's yes. in my same shoes. Yeah, when someone tells me that I motivate them, I'm just like, there's no way. But they do the same thing for me. So. You motivate me. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. That's the one thing that street parking, like, it changed my mind frame because I am a competitive person. I remember like, oh, I just, I have to do this or that. And then I started like intentionally being positive on other people's social media and I was like this is so contagious like it, mm -hmm. there's a there's enough pie for everyone right mm -hmm. it wasn't just all about me it became about all these people and how we can just keep lifting each other up so. mm -hmm. and you go on there and you see stories of like maybe you don't feel like working out or you don't feel like you know eating well and you go if if you just take a moment and go on the Facebook group you're gonna be like oh, gosh dang it this person you know just got off night shift and came home and did their workout or did it in the break room or did it while their kids were in the bath and you're like what's yeah. what am I complaining about here what or are my excuses if someone put in a story and tag you yeah you're like oh, okay I gotta I'm go do it now I can't let them down I've never met this person in my entire <laughs> life I don't even actually know their first name but I'm going outside now I, exactly yeah it's so great um you mentioned that you've always struggled with your weight so at what age did you recognize that? At what age um, did it become something that bothered you or that you felt like you were struggling with? I don't remember it not bothering me. Ever? Ever. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm bigger anyways. I'm taller, you know, so yeah. I was always taller. I was always a tomboy. Um, a lot of times I used it in sports, so that was to my advantage. What sports did you play? I played flag football. That was my first sport. Oh, my sport. gosh, Nicole's pumped. Yeah. yeah. So I was like – the biggest on the team too and I was the only girl all boys and oh, so that's awesome it was at like, what age oh uh, gosh it was first grade maybe okay so you're yeah. like Knox's age you're like six seven right okay. it was it was very early on I remember I got the MVP which was funny oh wow but I remember the picture at the <laughs> end of the season and I was like what why why am I so much bigger mm. than everyone and I was like that is, cr you know, wh what's going on? And I remember my mom was always like, you're just big boned, right? So, um, <laughs> You have yeah. siblings? I do. I have a sister and three Are brothers. Are they built like you? My sister is built like me, but very athletic mm -hmm. and, and just like body goals for me, mm. basically. So, And three yeah. brothers? Yes. What about them? Um, no. Isn't that funny? It is. Yeah. My mother struggled early okay. on, or, or actually almost into her, her 40s. Okay. She struggled. Um, didn't realize it at the time because I never thought she was, but she's always had a little bit of a weight issue. Okay. Now, no no weight issue at all. Wow. Um, she didn't start working out until maybe 10 years ago. Wow. And she's 74. Was she motivated so. by you? 
Yes, and vice versa. That's so awesome. Yeah, she had a lot of health issues and things, and, you know, yeah, I would always tell her and try to talk her through stuff. She's so. got these amazing grandbabies now, though. Yes. She's gotta she has to keep up with them. For. So, yeah. Okay, so fun, fun story. My sport, my only sport that I played as a child, because I, I wasn't really an athlete, was ice hockey. Oh, wow. And Because my brothers all played ice hockey, mm -hmm. and they needed a goalie for their roller <laughs> games in the basement. And so they padded me up, and they would just <laughs> hit pucks at me, and that was the only sport that I played. So I feel that's like that's crazy. football and hockey are where we come from. Yeah. That's why we're tough. Yeah. And then I ended up playing basketball in high school and was offered a college scholarship. Oh, wow. But I didn't take it. So. How come? So a little bit of a crazy story. Me and three friends. Um, to stay out of trouble, we rollerbladed at night. This was back when rollerblading was really cool. Like just around or yeah, like, like around the, the city. Okay. Because I grew up in a small town. Okay. So were we there were like glow bracelets and stuff. Like what's what kind no, of a? We were. No, <laughs> it was just complete darkness and rollerblading, and we went down a hill oh. to like mimic the Jamaican bobsled. Yeah. Oh yeah 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 yeah. Okay. okay. And uh, tragically, we crashed. They ended up in a creek. Um, had some brain damage, some facial reconstruction. Oh, no, both of them. Both of them. I pulled them out of the creek. And, of course, at that time, there were no cell phones, so, you know, running to call. Oh, my gosh. And um, so I felt like I needed to stay home and kind of take care you of them. You felt responsible. Right. Because I actually just kind of lay down in the street and just had a skinned arm. So, yeah. Wow. So. Man. So you, were, so you ended up staying home, and how mm -hmm. long... And then after that, the, the scholarship was just off the table. Yeah, basketball. it was. It was just he was like, well, if you're not going to come here, because it wasn't in my hometown. Right. So, yeah. Um, did you end up going to school? I did. I went to college. Uh, hated it. Went to college for two years. Uh, wanted to be a teacher and a coach, but couldn't wrestle with Coach Roach, which sounds really funny now because <laughs> a lot of people call me that. And uh, just wanted something more. So my mom was like, look, if you work 40 hours a week and make a 4.0, you can drop out. Hmm. Her thinking that was never going to happen, right? So I did it, and I dropped out of college. Okay. And I moved across the United States. Did you um, – so you were obviously an athlete in high school playing basketball and getting the scholarship. After <clears throat> that accident and when you weren't were no longer an athlete, were you – exercising did you still participate in like fitness type stuff yeah a little bit okay. yeah a little bit of everything always love weights and things like that um i think i really love weights because weights weren't pushed when i was in high school and i met a coach when i was in college who was actually the head volleyball coach and she really encouraged me to start weightlifting and so i took a weightlifting class that's and awesome so, yeah that always kind of continued that never really stopped that's something that i hope is different now i think it depends on where you go to school and what sports you play and stuff that is unfortunate that um at least when I was in school, it sounds like you as well. Uh, weightlifting, it wasn't really introduced to female athletes. Yeah, 100%. I saw more of it because I have brothers and because I ran track in high school. Um, and our coaches back then were great enough that they taught us how to do like bench press and back squat at least. Right. Uh, taught us is loose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, so that was my introduction to the weight room. But we didn't do it very often and we weren't instructed well on it. And it wasn't, we didn't have to do it. Like we could do it if we wanted to. Right. Yeah. We were allowed to do leg press, nice. but not squat because it was too dangerous. Too dangerous. Well, Remember well, that. Too dangerous equals, the, I don't know how to teach this. So I'm just right. going to go ahead and stick right. you on the leg press. All the machine. football players were doing it. And we were, I remember me and we had a group of friends and then we were like, we want to try it. And they were like, no, no, you, yeah. don't, you don't need to do that anyway. So. Yeah, I hope that it's better. I think in some places in different sports it is, but um, and not even for like the health aspect necessarily, but just because we're all built different and we all have different. It's fitness freedom, right? We're all built different. We all have things that we're going to gravitate toward that we find our love for. Right. And how many more girls could we have doing fitness if we didn't put them in such a small little box of what is offered to them? Oh, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Like. When you're a bigger person, of course you're going to love lifting because you're going to be good at it and right. it's going to be fun for you and you're going to be the best at it in your group or whatever. Yeah. And so I think exposing kids to as many different options and let them find their little niche that brings them joy. But I think uh, girls have, or at least they used to have less yeah. options for that stuff. Exactly. And then like even breaking the stereotypes like with my own son, my 15 year old, he does ballet. That's awesome. And he is jacked and ripped. And, you know, like, 
It's okay wow. to dance. It's okay to be a boy and dance. And yeah. like he's beautiful at yeah. it. Yeah. So we're really trying just to push that in That's my house. So cool. Pick whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah, just be active, whatever it is that you're drawn to. That's right. great. Yeah. And I mean, that also transfers to just so much, yeah. too, if he ever would just want to do something else. Um, OK, so you're in school. When did you start wanting to? Uh, OK, when did you become a police officer? Was that first? No. So I was in school, dropped out of school, moved to Augusta, Georgia, okay. hung out, <laughs> had fun, managed a music store. Oh. What yeah. kind of a music store? It like was a, Sam like a Goody record player. Mall. Okay. Yeah. So, but had a great time. Sam Goody. I mean, there's going to be people listening to this that have no idea what we're I know, talking about. I know. That's. I, I know. I you're thought about I was that. the coolest person in the uh, world because I is managed. Cool. Like an album comes out and you're just so pumped. Yeah. Every Tuesday, <laughs> right? And I have my regulars and we would listen to music and stuff. Dang. And so, yeah. And then ended up moving back to my hometown um, and just kind of milled around with things mm -hmm. for years, to be honest. I had like I, I managed a lot of stuff. I took on this persona of I don't need college. I can make it without college. Yeah, you were like trying to prove a point. Yeah, so I was a diehard. I'm not going to college. Uh -huh. and so had a um, couple other little things going on, but I was like, no, I'm never going to college. <laughs> so yeah. you had to prove to your mom that you didn't need it. Right, exactly. Even though she kept saying, please just go to college. And then. When did you, what, when did becoming a police officer, and then what was the other thing that you said that your principal, police officer, and trainer, yeah, what was the yeah. order of all of those roles? Okay, and so. And when did you find Whitney somehow, somewhere in there? Yeah, so um, I moved again to California, uh, lived in San Diego for a year, and became a medical coder. So random. I know. It was <laughs> the most boring job. I was miserable, but <laughs> you make a lot of money. Which you think is going to be fine for how boring it is, and it's really not. Right. <laughs> Moved back home again and couldn't find a job as a medical coder. Okay. I just, they, there's not jobs people Probably give Probably should have looked for it before you moved. Yeah, but, you know, that's <laughs> kind of not the way I roll. So um, a friend of mine who I went to high school with was like, look, the jail is hiring. I can get you a job. And I was like, okay, I've got to make money, right? Yeah. You're not getting a degree. you got to make money. So I started off as a jailer. What does a jailer do? So we basically, you basically go in there and monitor, you know, the, the inmates, feed them, do whatever you need, okay. book people in, okay. all of that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> made my way pretty quickly from just monitoring to booking, and that's where kind of everybody wants to be because that's where all, like, the action is, right, where people come in, they're brought in by the police, okay. and then you never know what's going to happen. And uh, Okay. This is in Texas, again, yep. in a small town. Right. Kay. Yeah, town of 87,000 people, okay. but still extremely busy. Like, okay. you know. 15, 20, maybe sometimes wow. 100. And you liked it? I loved it. I actually love the rush, the action, and you never know what's going to happen, the fighting, all of that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So worked my way up there to a corporal, worked my way up to sergeant, and had the opportunity to be the first female leader of the SWAT team at the wow. jail. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So I was like, let's do it. I'm going to do this. Here's my career, right? Were you, um, what were you doing for exercise during that? Because I would imagine that when you're involved with um, inmates, especially being the only female, that you want to be physically capable of. You would absolutely think so. <laughs> I'm not That's gonna, where my brain would go. <coughs> yeah, I'm not going to lie. I was smoking cigarettes and drinking beer. Oh, okay. I think this is an important part of your story, <coughs> It's though. a huge part of my story yeah. because I am also going to be at my unhealthiest weight ever. Wow. Right? So, yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> no, I did. We... We had some training for the SWAT. I was always like, really did you have to pass some sort of physical test? It wow. was. Oh, isn't that crazy? It is. It's a hundred percent crazy. Yeah. Now that I look back, I'm like, mm, this is this was not right. That's not so, good. But I was still strong. I was incredibly strong. Right. So to pat like to be the SWAT leader, I had to uh, be in a cell and like be attacked by like six individuals, oh and I had to try to make gosh. my way out of there. Oh my gosh. So yeah, I mean, I I did it, and then the next step is being a police officer. So. Okay. I, um, that, I, that has some tests. Not, well, not like what you would think, actually. Okay, so okay. once again, I put myself through the academy, kind of did the back way route because I also needed to work uh -huh. and be in the academy just to make ends meet. You're so. still smoking and drinking when you're going through the police academy? 100%. Okay. Yeah, it was like a badge of honor. I hate what to say that. What kind of food were you eating? Water burger, fast food, whatever. When you work midnight to eight, I was not. About halfway through that, I did 
there were times when I tried, right? And I would drop a dramatic amount of weight, you know, meal prep and do all that. But like the push. It never stuck. To, no, it, it, it just didn't. It, That's yeah. like what most people do. Like there not there's not many people who never try, like go through right. their whole life and never think like, oh, let me let me do this plan at, at New Year's or, you know. Yeah. Right. So it was the kind of the typical like there would be periods where you'd be motivated and you would do stuff and then. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So my son is tapping yeah. on the window right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, so how long were you a police officer for? So I from think working at the jail through when you stopped being a cop, a little around six years. Okay, right. I got a job as a police officer. I actually uh, got my def deputy sheriff badge, but then I transitioned to. Was this all in that same town? Mm -hmm. Okay, being a college police officer, I thought it's just like a patrolling around the campus, right? Monitoring the campus and all that. And I was asked to be a women's self defense instructor, so I went to this training. Okay. And I had to simulate an attack. Once again, I'm being attacked, and i got to fight my way out of it. So no one is ever picking me up, but this man <laughs> attacked me from behind and picked me up off the ground. Oh, my gosh. And I was like, wait a minute. When I landed, I bent over and headbutted him. Oh, and turned around and punched him yeah, in the and face. Yeah, you're like the kindest person. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. <clears throat> and I blew out my L4 and L5. Ooh. Yeah. When you landed. Right. But oddly enough, right before we were warming up, and it's a, there's like 50 police officers in a room, and we're warming up with jumping jacks and high knees. And literally, I had that moment of, I am so unhealthy. Mm, just because of the warm up. Right. I'm 270 pounds. Wow. How could I chase a human being or help anyone? Yes. So I literally, the switch flipped for me, and I was like, as soon as I get out of this training, I'm going home, I'm getting healthy, and then not five minutes later, I blow out my L4 oh, and L5. Okay. So, so <clears throat> how bad was it? Like, what was the recovery like from that? So, and so was that when you were out from being a police officer? Was that yeah, for that? Yeah, so eventually I got home, kind of refused to go to the doctor. I actually lost control of my bowels. Oh, it was that no. bad? Yeah, because of the nerves and everything, yeah. yeah. Went to the doctor, finally got into a doctor, and he's like, you're you're done. Uh, and I was like, no, no, wait, I'm, I'm fixing to start this weight loss journey. And he's like, like I have a plan. Yeah, it came like, to me. Yeah, I'm like, here. And he's like, no, you're done. You're going to get fused. Uh, you probably will uh, never work out again. You won't run. Okay, yes. I All wanted these to hear things. this part of the story. Okay. Yeah. And I'm like, no. And he's like, this is what you have to do. This is all still pre-Whitney? Yes. Okay. No, no, no. We've met at this time. Okay. Yeah, okay. we've met at this time because she really encouraged but me. But pre-your your, your boys. Yeah, pre-boys. Okay. All of that. Yeah. So, um. You know, I go home, and I get in a really, really, really dark period. Mm -hmm. um, not really getting any medical care because it's workman's comp, right? Yeah, there's And ladies. so, yeah. It, They're going to do the minimum. Right, and not really knowing. I have a doctor that's telling me everything's about to be fused. Um, and I go into a really dark place where I really start drinking Ooh. and just feeling very sorry for myself. The opposite of what the plan was that came to you. Right. Instead of just being like, you know, this is what I'm going to do. So, and uh, it's pretty close to a birthday. I can't remember which birthday. Okay. But um, the Iron Man airs. It used to air in December on TV. Mm -hmm. And so I'm watching it and I'm watching these adaptive athletes, right? Mm. And I am just like, you pathetic human, <laughs> right? You're sitting here with all of this time on your hands. So I could barely walk, but I got up and I started walking. Oh. And then I got into this amazing work hardening program, which is eight hours of physical therapy a day. Mm -hmm. They agreed to take me on for a month and kind of see where I was. And uh, by the end of it, I was running wow. and everything and was able to get back on the police force. Wow, okay. Yeah, and it was pretty much about two weeks into the police force when I was like, I don't want to do this anymore mm -hmm. because I was I had spent so much time with my wife and my family that I was like there's got to be something else isn't that crazy like because <clears throat> I had a similar experience with my injury where sometimes I think some of us are so stubborn as humans that it's like regardless whether whatever it is you believe in God the universe whatever like mm -hmm. They're tr it's trying to tell you something, but some of us are so stubborn. Oh. We won't listen, so it's fine. You know what? 
you're, I got to blow out your L4 and L5 to get you to slow down and realize that you, it's time to go another direction. For me, it was like tearing my ACL in the middle of the CrossFit games is like, right. stop competing, go do something, go find a family, go, you know, so that I could meet Julian and, and start my family and everything. But like, I'm sure there were other signs pointing to it's time to go do something else before that. Yeah. But I'm too oh, stubborn to It always to has to be it. something giant, right? Massive. For me, yes. Yes. Always. Yep. Um, and, but I also think that a lot of people are like that. And I think a lot of people who, um, from my experience in fitness, they have to hit a low that's so low. And then like you felt like have this like moment of like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. But it has to be like in your, like the Ironman was that for you where you're just like, and the adaptive athletes right. that was just like. And the way that you spoke to yourself, a lot of people would be like, oh, you know, you, you got to love yourself and be kind to yourself, which I agree with. But right. there is a point where you got to look yourself in the mirror and be like, what are you doing? Oh, who right. are you? Who, who are you trying to be? And I think some of the best ter like success stories started there right. you yeah, know, you, with that realization. You, you have to. I mean, you know, you have to be uncomfortable to be comfortable. I really firmly believe that. Yeah, I, I believe we're made to be put in hard situations. Um, I don't think I put myself in enough. Mm -hmm. I was obviously very comfortable. I mean, I was intelligent enough to get a, a job as a police officer and convince someone at 270 pounds that I could take care of things, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I probably could have, mm -hmm. but it wasn't the right thing to do at the time. Right. And so that's when I was like, I need to step away from this and really find out, you know, what my purpose is. Yeah, do you ever trip out when you think about like, what if you wouldn't have hurt your back that day? Like, where would your life be? Oh, I, <clears throat> my wife and I have a, this conversation all the time because I'm so grateful for her because she was also very instrumental in, in this. I would be in a bar and I would be over 300 pounds. Mm. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. That's so crazy. I would probably have a decent job. I'd still be a police right. officer, but I don't think my quality of life would be what it is. Wow. Yeah. So. Okay, well, that's, that's an amazing story. Okay, so you decide you're going to leave. Mm -hmm. And then uh, did you, is that when you started working at the school? or So <clears throat> we're no, yeah, there was a period between yeah. where you were trying to be a trainer and stuff. And you did. Right. And I want to talk about the half Ironman that you did. Like, where did that come in? Yeah, so as a result of kind of rehabbing my back, I began. Did uh, you end up having the fusion? No. Okay. 100%. I refused surgery. Did that's it great. on my own. Very fortunate that, you know, stretching and everything that the chiropractor I went to, for the, they, were, they were amazing. They really taught me a lot about how I can take care of my back and what to do and the science That's to look awesome. for. Um, started doing the triathlon thing. Uh, did a sprint try, hated running, and was like, did one sprint try. I was like, I'm hooked. I'm doing a half Ironman in like four months. Wow. And around the same time, my wife and I, we always make big decisions on travel. So we were driving <laughs> down, I know, the worst time. We're driving down the road and she's like, I want to go to college. Wow. She had never been to college. And I was like, all right, you can do it. And she said, and you have to go to college and finish. Uh, and so I was like, see, it's that bullying. Yep. So I was like, <laughs> okay. So we both quit our jobs. Wow. Thank goodness for my mother-in-law who let us live in her third story apartment. Okay. And we went to college. Wow. And so we're pretty much starting out the same, you know, taking courses. Obviously I had two years, but right. still. Um, and I didn't go for education. I went for kinesiology and biology because I was like. Because you were so like. And motivated or like inspired right. by what happened with your back. Yeah, and I'm on this you know weight loss journey and things yeah. are going really really well, and um, she ended up getting her degree. So you're not smoking and drinking anymore. I had stopped both I, of those. Yeah, occasional. I drink occasional. But you weren't but smoking yeah. anymore. Uh, by the time, obviously, yeah. if you're training for a half iron. Yeah, man. exactly. <laughs> that was yeah. There was a run one time, and I was like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> You know, because I would literally go you run. You were still smoking when you were running oh, at I first? I would literally go run and smoke a cigarette in the park. Oh, yeah. my gosh, Leanne. And then I was like, you're, okay, cut it. How was that quitting before we get into the, because I, you know, obviously that's something a lot of people yeah. <clears throat> struggle with. How was that quitting journey for you? Was it like a one day you quit and that's it? Or was there like relapses or was it cutting down slowly? Nope, just stopped one day. Oof. Yeah. When did it stop being hard? Um, you know what? We were getting married, mm -hmm. and, like, when you find your person and you want to spend forever with them, and she was also a smoker, and we were like, this is it. This is what we're doing. So it really wasn't that hard, to be honest with you. You know, I told my brother <clears throat> recently that it, when you find the right person, you don't become a better person because they nag you into it. You become a better person because they inspire you into it. 
Yes, that and that is exactly the epitome of my wife. Yeah, um, I can yeah. see that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> from yeah. So, yep. So I just quit, and then started everything, and you know, was going to college, and on that journey, she became a teacher. I was, you know, still figuring out. Became a personal trainer during nice when I got my degree. So I started personal training, <coughs> which of course made no money at all. Oh no. Right. <laughs> no so, one becomes a trainer to be rich. And I started working out of all places. She convinced me to apply at Curves. Oh, stop. But you know what it did? I met so many amazing And it's women. not even that I think that there's anything wrong with Curves. I just don't associate you with Curves. No, 100%. <laughs> no, I remember walking in there, and they were just, like, looking at me, and the, I was like... The cop. I, the former yeah, cop. I was so mad at my wife. I was like, she tricked me into getting this <laughs> job, right? But um, when I started to hear these women's stories Ugh. and how they were literally doing the best they could mm-hmm. and they had thousands of workouts and they came every day and they worked out and they had their people, I started to feel so motivated by them that I was like, I asked my boss, I was like, hey, can we add maybe this to their workout? Wow. And she was like, okay, yeah. And this was around the time Curves partnered with Jillian Michaels. Oh, gosh. And so, so the dive bomb kettlebell swing, you had, did you add that in? Yeah, it? no, so <laughs> in between those hydraulic machines, uh-huh. we're doing burpees and things. Okay. That brought life to me. Because I mean, that's I, cool. Right? Yeah. And so <clears throat> Curves was the temporary thing until I graduated from college. But it forever changed me because it really made me listen to people and, like, realized that not everybody had to have like you didn't have to go hard all the time some mm-hmm. people are just literally doing the best they could mm-hmm. right and their success stories were unbelievable and it, and i think curves um supplied what we were talking about earlier it provided a place where you're going to see people who look like you yes and people a community of people who are in the same mindset right and they embrace me <coughs> i don't still know why they embrace me they love me they supported me through my half Ironman. They wow. donated money. Wow. They cheered me on. So you so had a good relationship with like the owner of your location and everything. Great. Yeah. Forever grateful for for that job because it just it changed my mentality too. So when you were working at Curves is when you were training for the half Ironman. Mm-hmm. Um, were you doing any other sort of training? Like were you doing weight training and stuff at that time also? Yeah. Always a little bit of weight training. Okay. Yeah. Just because, you know, I still loved it. And you were fine with all of the running even with your back. Right. Yeah. No problems. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. So. Um, I, you know, and I think that's really cool because I think it's a really important story. I was uh, talking to somebody the other day where it's like so many people, when, when people find out that I work in fitness, I'll be like on an airplane with someone and they'll, they'll tell me all the reasons that they can't work out. You probably get that a lot too. Mm-hmm. As soon as they find out you're into fitness, it's like they'll tell you all the reasons that they can't. And every adult has something they might not have an injury that was as drastic as yours or some of the injuries that i've had but everybody's got well you know back in high school i tore my mcl or well i tore my achilles back in the day or i have this shoulder thing so i can't can't." squat because i have bad knees (laughs) right and most people get that information from their doctor like your first doctor who told you you're never going to be able to do any of this again right and they just take that as truth and never question it and never figure out if there's a way around it or other stuff they can do. They just, well, I'm, I can't ever exercise again or I can't ever squat again or I can never run again. And sometimes it's true and you gotta figure out alternatives, right. but so often that is not the case and there are other options and you can keep moving um, like you saw with those adaptive athletes doing the Ironman. And it's so sad that people allow that to get into their head and it just becomes part of their identity that I can't, X. Yeah. Fitness isn't for me anymore because of X, Y, Z. And people really believe that about themselves. And it's hard to get them out of that. Yeah. Um, even when I was doing Ironmans, I, I was um, around 210. Mm-hmm. And people were like, you, you can't do a half Ironman at 210 pounds. It's not possible. <laughs> You're too big. They call it the Athena division because... I mean, yeah. at least they gave it a cool name. Athena and Clydesdale. So Clydesdale okay. for the men. So, okay. you know, you, you can't do this. It, uh, it's not sustainable. Your body could not possibly go for that long. Wow. And even when I was at Ted... Like, what kind of people would say that? You know, normal, average. I'm not... I'm average, but, you know, just people who weren't in it or whatever. Like, family members, coworkers? Like, what kind of... Everybody. Okay. Yeah, everybody. Coworkers especially. 
especially during that time. Where were you working? Um, so when Besides I really curves, when I started tries and stuff, I was still a police officer. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the curves ladies would have never said that they were no, like, of course I would assume anything's they possible. Would, yeah. Right. But you know, even my own mom, I know she was like, mm. I mean, my parents have given me some of that stuff too. Yeah. They probably looked at me when I was competing so. in the CrossFit games and just been like, what are you doing? Like grow up. You're an adult. Go right. get a regular job, please. Right. So it was just like, you know, don't you think you need to lose like 20, 30 more pounds? pounds and then try this and it really pissed me off wow and so I was like no I'm now I'm definitely gonna do this because and yeah. I gotta be honest it was hard to find stuff in my size and and they're sure. right when you're doing something like that you typically back then especially people did not look you know my size but that never stopped you you never listened to it right it actually probably did. It sounds like it fueled you a little bit. It did. Prove, it absolutely did. Kind of like your mom. I prove, proved to your mom that, that you didn't need to go to college. You're going to prove to all these people that you could do the triathlon. Right. 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 Um, okay. So then you leave Curves. And, w and when did you get into working as a principal? So I became a teacher and a coach. Okay. What did kind that, of teacher? Uh, I was <laughs> uh, social studies. thought social studies. Okay. What, how old? S sixth grade. Okay. And then eighth grade. And then we moved to Fort Worth. And I became a science teacher. Wow. And then a social studies teacher. Same age? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, and then I was like, oh, I really think I could do this assistant principal gig. Wow. So I got my principalship at the encouragement of my wife once again, got my master's and principalship. And um, oddly enough, when I started at the school in Fort Worth, I told my principal at the time, I'm going to be your assistant principal one day. Ah. And she was like, she laughed, you know. Because it's just not common to also start at a school and become an assistant principal at okay. school. She was like, sure, yeah, I'm sure you are. And Great. so <laughs> yeah, she ended up being my mentor, and so oh, that's I did awesome. get to work with her for a few years. So. And um, your boys are adopted. Mm -hmm. Did uh, how? Tell me a little bit about that story and timeline, and because you said it's like an interesting story and it happened really fast. <laughs> it is. So, um, and not many people actually know, uh, my wife and I were pregnant. And we lost our child. Oh, no. Very, very what early year? on. How long? Very, very early okay. on. But um, it was just tragic, right? Yeah. It was more tragic um, for my wife because all she ever wanted to do was be a mother. And so, you know, I'm you go into, like, help mode, what can I do and all these things. Um, I don't even know that I had time to grieve before she was like, let's foster and adopt. Mm -hmm. And Whitney, when Whitney wants something, mm -hmm. it's going to happen, and it's going to happen as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So literally a month later, mm -hmm. she's like, here's all the classes we're going to do. Mm -hmm. Here's when we need to attend. And if we do everything, we can do this the fastest that anyone's done it, and we could literally have a child within two months. Oh, my gosh. And I have still, even after almost 16 years, am like, okay, Whitney. And literally... That's what happened. Wow. We got the call that we were going to get. Well, I was teaching in the middle of teaching, and there was a phone in my classroom, and she calls, and she's like, they're sending us a beautiful baby boy. Yeah, because that's kind of what happens, right, is right. Um, they once you get through all of the stages, they say, like, okay, you, you, we could just call you, and the next day a child is going to be placed with you. Right. So, so she's you have like, to be, like, <coughs> prepared. Yeah, she's like, we have a couple weeks. They're going to miss a little couple weeks. Uh, he's a beautiful two-year-old boy. And I'm like, awesome. And she's like, what's his name again? Trey. Trey. Yeah. She's like, there's like a silence. And I was like, what, Whitney? What? She goes, he has a brother. He's a bit older. So we're going to take both of them. And the older brother's name is? Corey. So uh, they, they are um, biological brothers. OK, yeah, I didn't know yeah. that. Um, and I hung up the phone because I was like, there's two of them. Bye. Yeah, I was like. <laughs> I'm in my first year of teaching. We're not doing this. This oh is crazy. Gosh. How old was Corey? He was seven, and Trey was two. Okay. So, um, and, and I it was foster to foster yeah, it was them. Foster first. to adopt. So, yeah. Um, Which is also really like, from what I know about that process, it's um, really stressful because you, from the first day, create this like relationship with these kids and then but it's not right necessarily that they're going to be with you 100 is that how that situation 100 percent because um you know also too um, i mean i don't i don't want to lie everybody wants a baby right when you right okay so literally 
two days after we found out about the boys, we got a call at one o'clock in the morning, woke up by our, our advocacy person. And it was like, we have a little girl. And um, I remember sitting like they there. They asked you to choose? <laughs> I remember sitting That's there. So weird. And Whitney, it's, like, it's like, you know, Whitney choosing was a puppy. Yeah, looked it's at so me. Weird. And I was like, no, we're not doing that. We've already committed to something, right? Oh. And so we committed and we got to meet Trey before mm-hmm. we um, actually fostered him. Went to a birthday party that he was at. He was in a bouncy house and he slid out of the bouncy house. And we were like, I was just like, oh, this is, oh. I'm over with at this point, right? Yeah. And then I think maybe like a week later, when we were actually getting placed with them, I met Corey for the first time. Corey hopped out of a, a Mustang with like just this little bag, like it's so cliche. And he had the biggest smile and he said, hi, I'm Corey and I'm going to live with you. Mm. And I was like, welcome, you know. We had this amazing first night where they had Ninja Turtle pajamas. Oh. We bought like chicken nuggets and all the traditional stuff that kids would eat. Of course. And, you know, he was like, this is great. I love it here. How much time had you spent with little kids at this point? Because taking in two kids that age when like, I mean I guess you were a teacher so you that's good both of you were mm-hmm. so, so okay she that's was good. she was elementary okay so great. she was definitely great. way more prepared it's a lot of energy coming in yeah I was not prepared okay no, I, was, I had middle school kids but it was not I was not prepared for any of this for little kids like, I was blindsided okay by plus two I have a wife who was like we're gonna feed them natural food <laughs> and cloth diapers and like a week into that she's like no <laughs> You get what you get. I mean, it's the, it's just the same thing happens with biological parents as well. You're like, I have this, these grand plans that go out the window real fast. Wrong. So, <laughs> um, and the, for as amazing as the foster system is, maybe they don't tell you everything about the child you're getting or the children you're getting. Uh-huh. So you quickly learn. Um, my seven-year-old had night terrors. Like I've never seen, and I just remember holding him and him being soaking wet, and just feeling so helpless because, you know, what do you, what do you do, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, for a kid? Um, and you have no history with him to know what works and what doesn't work and what could comfort him because it could have been something so easy had you known about it. Right. But you know, you have no history to know. Right. And um, come to find out. I believe we were his seventh placement. Oh my gosh! Well, no wonder. That's, right. Yeah, that's that's tough. And he'd been you in hear s- those stories a lot. Seven first grade classes, <sighs> and he was uh, he was living in the shelter, which is absolutely not. But ideal. Were both of them, or was the two and a half no, year old the still and with the mom? He was in a foster. Oh, he was, he was okay. in a foster care. So they they were separated. Right. Okay. Which is even so worse, sad. Yeah. To be honest. So. Yeah. Man, I bet. I mean, I can't even imagine what being a parent is hard no matter what type of child you have, however, how many children you have, how they came to you, whatever. But um, that acclimation period where you have two of them and they're not babies and they're, they, you know, they come with a story, that's, right. that's a lot. Yeah, it, it was heavy, it was hard. Um, if not for a loving, supportive partner, I'm not sure we would have made it through. Um, you fall it's hard on your relationship too, though I'm sure. Right, because so um, stressful when you have a troubled seven-year-old <clears throat> that you you know don't know anything about. You you know you start to grasp at straws and try things, and you have bad days where and people giving you advice unsolicited, right, all over the place. Right. I'm sure, and um, you can't leave them unless with anyone unless they're foster certified too. Mm. So I mean, the, you, there's all sorts of rules and stuff. Yeah, yes. my mom was six hours away mm-hmm. I mean what you get no reprieve mm-hmm. so luckily a co-worker got certified wow and she was our uh, this from the school yeah our first support of being there because then you get into court proceedings and us having to travel to court and you know experience that whole thing and as you're going through court you're hearing things that you're like wait what this child this happened I mean it's oh just my God. unbelievable the stuff that you know is going on and then you start to fall in love really and you're thinking you know what can I do how do how do I how how does this become forever I can want it but in the eyes of the law I can't force it how long were they with you before they you were actually like their adoptive parents almost two years that's uh, and that's so scary yes 
like um, our littlest is one. I can't imagine it still being like up in the air whether or not I was going to be his mom forever. Right. Like that's crazy. Yeah, because you know you're trying to teach these life skills and you're having these moments and you're having Christmas and well, you see them like improving and right. Yeah, and then I remember um, <laughs> trying to teach my seven year old to ride a bike. And he's <laughs> like, I know how to ride a bike. He didn't know how to ride a bike. <laughs> but um, just the direct defiance, because he also, at seven, unfortunately has the wherewithal is, why should I invest in you? I'm of just, course. I'm just going to be gone. Right. And so, um, you know, just constantly telling him, you're not going anywhere. Yeah. And then. And you want it to be true. Like, you don't want to lie to them. That's the last thing you want. Right. Right. And so, in a sense, you're kind of lying to yourself. <sighs> A little bit, yeah. You know? So, yeah. That's so. Cr I mean, what an amazing thing that you have given them, though. Oh, I hope you know that. No, completely opposite. I, I agree with you. I mean, both. Yeah, I know. Yes. But they saved our lives. Like they saved my life personally. Like there's been a couple of moments of things that I can list off that have saved my life. My children is definitely in that top five of things that I didn't know I needed, and yeah. So. Oh yeah. man. So how did that change your perspective when it cuz if it sounds like a lot of your motivation for everything in your life was to I'm going to prove everybody wrong mm -hmm. type thing. Yeah. How did that soften you and like change your motivation for fitness and and all of it now that you have these two little boys? Um not going to lie. I never really even thought I was going to make it to like 29 years old. Wow. I'm not even sure I had the desire to. And then all of a sudden you wake up one day and you have a reason for living, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so that's it right there. I want to see this through. I want to see them become young men and have families and change the world and all mm -hmm. this. So instantly, what do I have to do to make sure that that happens? So, yeah. It, it, it's so powerful. And I, you know, you know that it, within the street parking community, um, a large percentage of our members are parents. And I think similar to finding somebody who looks like you, finding somebody who's in that same life stage and feels that way, I mm -hmm. think is one of the things that bonds our community together so much Right, is the amount of parents that feel exactly the way that you do. And the motivation is in general out there on like social media, fitness is, it's just so gross. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's so uh, shallow and um, glamorous or trying to be show, show off. And I love our community because it's not that, it's like very real. Even for people obviously who don't have kids, but it's very, it's very real. Right. And I love that and um, wow. Yeah. Okay, so now, so you got them when they were two and a half and seven and how old are they? They're 16 and? 15 and eight. 15 and eight now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're eight years. Yeah, seven, yeah, cause they, we got them, they, they like, had birthdays a couple months so we celebrated our seventh gotcha day oh what did, what day is it so december 7th okay so and yeah. that was the adoption day or the day they came to your home no that's the day they came to our home okay i, I honestly can't even tell you their adoption day when it pops up on my like time hop I'm it like, tells oh. you yeah but it, yeah so we just december 7th they showed up right and you had so, them for christmas right away yeah oh it's crazy it was oh, crazy man yeah so. um that's so awesome, and they're doing great. They're doing amazing, yeah. Um, my oldest has a lot of developmental issues and stuff, um, but getting the proper care for him and him being in a supportive environment and the school he's at and just being loved on by so many people mm -hmm. has literally changed They're his. so cute. Yeah, thank you, yeah. I love when you post them. Yeah. Okay, so let me see here, what am I, what am I missing? So you found the community within street parking and one of the things that you said when we spoke before the podcast was you felt that you were not alone. And I think that's a really weird thing because actually, technically, you're working out I know. alone. So how can, can you explain that a little bit more for um, members who, or people who might be listening who are not members or maybe members who they, they've signed up for the program, but they haven't really gotten into the community part of it? Yeah. So I guess a huge missing piece of the story would be my mental health battles. Okay, yes. Right, because I think to a lot of people, if you're successful and you have careers and you have a family, you may not have mental health issues, right? Um, after the Ironman and things like that, I really started to recognize that I have depression and anxiety. Do you think that you had had that for a long time? Oh, 100%. I mean, I, I told you, 
I mean, I didn't think didn't I was going to live yeah, to 29. Right. It wasn't because. And that's a weird thing to think. It, it is, right? Yeah. yeah. Once I realized that's not normal. Right. <laughs> you know, and then even like, you know, going on like, mm, you know, there's, there was a lot going on in my head. Like you didn't see yourself as a 44 year old. No, no. I, I really thought I was going to probably self-destruct. Um, so, um, and I'm no doubt when I was a police officer, I felt like it was really frowned upon right, to have mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And so, and then being from a small town in Texas, you know, you suck it up. So as I, you know, became more educated and started to travel and things like that, I realized something was really, really wrong. Um, what was it that made you recognize that? There was a lot, but <clears throat> my father, who I was not close to at all, mm -hmm. um, he, my parents divorced in 2008. I stayed back with him. It was a whole bad situation. Uh, when he passed away, had a lot of anger and resentment. Mm. Um, and I like, I think he had mental health issues, right? Because a lot of the things I was doing were very reminiscent of my father. Oof. So was, when, my, uh, was my father yeah. a bad man or did he have mental health issues? And just, I mean, back then, like, yeah. Especially as a man, like, right. We can't talk about that. 100%. Yeah. So I just really started thinking, uh oh. Uh, you saw, you saw right. him in, you, in yourself. Yeah. The isolation that he did a lot from the family. Um, I had a lot of anger. I was a very angry person. Mm. Um, all of these things that I was like, ah, oh, wait, there's probably something more to this. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> once again, loving and supportive wife started talking to me about these things and being like, you know, it, it's really okay to not be okay. Mm -hmm. um, that's what really resonated with me for street parking is, you know, seeing Jess post. And I was like, oh my gosh, this speaks to me so much. How can I help? How can I get in there? And yeah, I don't, I, it's still hard to explain to people. I would prefer to work out alone. Same. But I feel I mean, like I'm never usually. alone. Yeah. Right. Because I have a few people that I check in with all the time and like how the workout go and all that. Checking in with Jess, talking to her on the phone. It's so funny. We'll text back and forth and she'll just FaceTime me. And I'll never forget the first time I was like, are you literally, are you, this human is FaceTiming me. <laughs> so, but I like talk to her and like an hour later, I'm like, oh man, I feel so good. Like she literally puts She's things awesome. in perspective. If you're yeah. listening to this and you don't know who we're talking about, Jess Schultz um, is Suffer With Friends on Instagram. And uh, she has a like charity nonprofit thing that she does each year, where she'll do like a workout, and she does more than one thing. But um, she raises money for suicide awareness and prevention, and just mental health stuff in general. Um, our little key necklaces now help with her fundraising efforts to that. But she's been a member for a long time. She is very open about her own struggles with that stuff and her own weight loss journey and all of that. Um, and she's just an awesome human. Right. Yeah. Yes. So there was my, I was looking for something different to fit in with street parking, but there was my fit in. That mm -hmm. was it. That's really what I was looking for, mm -hmm. to be able to have these conversations with people who felt like everything was closing in on them, but they had an outlet to kind of put it, you know, at bay. And then here's everything else that we can do. I have a question. Um, and this is just like, for me personally, I really want to know, but maybe other people are interested in this as well is I think that there's a fine line right between I'm sharing my struggles because I need help and I'm open to help or I'm sharing my struggles because I want attention and I actually don't or maybe I'm just not ready at this moment to do anything about it and I think we get a lot of both of those things on like our Facebook group and posts and stuff like that and sometimes the people who are, I just want attention, attention's maybe not what you should be giving them because then it just fuels them to keep doing more. What, do you have any thoughts about that? Or have you seen that? How do you, how would you approach something like that? Do you know what I'm talking yeah, about? No, I hundred percent because I could be so judgmental sometimes. Well, I'm you like, don't ever want to like judge right away. Right. But you see patterns with certain people. Right. Yeah. And it's like you see the steps of like, oh, you know, it's so it's such a gray area too, right? Yes. Um, because part of me, the the part of me that's like I'm gonna get it done part is like just like suck it up and get some help. Yes. But I went so many years with not even recognizing I needed help. Uh huh. So I, I guess I really don't have an answer. Right. For that, that that's so hard, you know. Um, 
obviously there are a few times when money is involved. That seems to be a bit of a red flag. Yeah, of course. Where right? People are like asking for GoFundMes and but stuff. But also like that. too, if you don't have insurance, I mean, therapy is expensive. Yes. Yeah. Right. So. Who am I to? It's tough. Who am I to judge on that? Um, and I think everybody's on their own journey as far as it goes with right. that. You know, so that, that's that's such a hard one because I, I know I've seen it and and I to be honest with you, that's really why I'm more of an Instagram person because you get like <laughs> that little snippet of a story. Right. The comments and the Facebook goes a little crazy. Yeah. So. Yeah, you know, and I, I guess maybe a better route to take is if you are an individual, I think a, you're going to get a lot of people who listen to this who want to hear your story because of um, how what you share and your relationship with Suffer With Friends and Jess and everything. Um, when you're reaching out for help, be open to help. 100%. That's the thing. When I reach out to, um, I have a street broken friend, I'm in Vegas, Anna, and she's very good about checking, and when she makes a recommendation... Like, I need to take it. Mm -hmm. She's not just doing it just to be nice. Right. Like, slow down and stop. Right. You need to take that. That's it. When when I talk to Jess on the phone and she's like, that doesn't make any sense. Find your people that are going to be honest with right. you, too. Hear it not out. Not coddle you. Because I think that's where, yeah. you if you can find your people that are going to be honest and kind mm -hmm. and, and listen to you, but not ever make it worse by going down there going down the rabbit hole with you right because i'm very much a no yeah. one is coming to save you person yes they're really not at some point you you have to save yourself mm -hmm. so yeah I, I see that yeah, yeah so. everybody's in a different place though yeah. oh yeah for and sure. i think a lot of the people that do that they're just not ready for the help yet like yeah. they, they they're not coming from a bad place for the most part but also to get help you have to completely change everything and that's you hard. have to be ready for right. that. Like I say a lot of times, I get I get knocked about this a lot of times. I say growth is very sexy <laughs> because to me it is, but growth is completely uncomfortable. I tell people all the time in my job, growth is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You feel awful right now. If nothing feels right, that actually means you're growing. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's a hard area to be in when you are growing because at that time, it, it's miserable. Mm-hmm. And it's, I mean, we've talked about that on this podcast in, in several different ways or I've said it in posts, like seeking out discomfort because you know that's where the, the growth is um, I mean you follow the endurance programming which you probably follow because it sucks yes. that's why most people follow it actually they seek out that program because it's the most complained about program right um, and that's an example of that yeah I wanted I wanted to I'll go say what we're gonna I was say. just gonna say there's like such beauty and discomfort yes um, because you know I was do relate it if I can do an endurance workout that's miserable then I can go do my job for a week Exactly. Right. So. What's going to be worse than that? Nothing. Right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you know, it yeah. is so true. No, it's very true. You build up a, a stronger mind. And when you're doing, I, I think fitness is such a great outlet for that because no one is forcing you to do it. So you're actively choosing to be that uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And you, you can either coast through the workout or you can lean into it and make it as uncomfortable as you can, as you're ready for that day. And like the more you can lean into it, the just more resilient of a, of a mind that you're creating, not yeah. let alone your body. Like that's a whole separate right, topic, yeah. but the mind stuff is so you can do so you can teach yourself so much through uncomfortable fitness, yep. the physical stuff. It's, and it's a form of meditation big time too. Yeah especially the endurance workouts where there's not a lot of like counting and stuff involved right. and you're just going, mm -hmm. you just go and you just, just go, put your head you don't have to think about it. Nope. You don't have to remember how many reps nope. you're on or anything. I wanted to ask you about your schedule because you are one of the few people that actually said that you don't have a super set structured schedule. I mean, these people that are here with you in this group, uh, they're the 4 these people are crazy. Yes. They're like, I mean, we got a, we got a bunch of military people here this time and police. And so you don't have a super set structure. You're actually an evening, um, somebody who works out in the evening, which I feel like the morning is more common. Right. So talk a little bit about what your fitness schedule is now. Yeah. So all over the place yeah. because <laughs> so I wake up at 4.50. Okay. Um, and then I'm usually at work around 7, 7, 10. So I get to work really early. Right. Because school, um, what time does the, what time do the kids Doors open up? at 8. Okay. But, and then some days I may stay at school till 6 or 7. Wow. Okay. So, um, a long day. It's a, it's a very long day. So, and then it's important for me to go home and have dinner with my kids. Yes. Right. And sit there. And, um, 
then it's time. So you're like 8 p.m. fitness. Sometimes, 7 to 8, depending wow, on, okay. yeah, yeah, 7. That's hard. Yeah, I mean, on a good day, in fact, honestly, if I get home early and it's like 5, I'm like, I can't work out right now. It's too early. Wow. So, and I really, um, with this year and everything that's been going on um, with my school, I am trying to be really forgiving of myself. I was talking to somebody who was here, and he's like, you realize you're still working out four times a week, right? Even though you're complaining about not working out on <laughs> Isn't Monday, that funny? Monday, Tuesday, If Wednesday. I take one extra rest day, I'm like, I, w- I basically didn't work out this week. Exactly. At all. So <laughs> I have allowed myself and given myself the grace this year to be like, I might take a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday off. Mm-hmm. Just because I'm physically exhausted from work. Right. Right? Um, still going for a walk or doing something like that. But so that's why I say I don't have a – it depends on the day, right, of what's happened. Um, so I don't set myself up for failure, but I also hold myself accountable to a certain standard. It's just a very flexible standard. You know, it's one thing that I've um, really enjoyed lately. I don't know if you saw, but we had a friend of mine, Kariana and Bill, her husband Bill, they own a brand called Between the Ears. Um, and one of the things that I loved in my conversations with them is just be honest. Like, if you honestly ask yourself like if if the tr- if the truth is i'm too exhausted to work out and you know that's the truth then there should be no guilt around it you shouldn't feel bad about it right. it's when you start not being like not doing what you could do right. and like r- searching for the excuse yeah. and so it, just be honest and if it's an honest effort then there's no even if that's two days a week yeah. that's all you honestly have right now that's all you honestly have and just as long as you're doing that yep. um i wanted you to share that that you that your structure's all over the place and that you work out in the evening and it's not this great schedule because the reality is that's how it is for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And I think that they just need to hear that that's okay. Yeah. I, like, I commend these 4 a.m. people. They're but nuts. I also think that it is perfectly acceptable to fit it in when you can fit mm-hmm. it in. I just think long-term, it makes a whole lot more sense. I could literally start on Thursday and wake up at 4 a.m. and work out, and I could tell you within a few days, I would be so miserable and so angry. <laughs> That's me, though, you know? So, yeah. I, I mean, it, yeah, it, it is what it is. And there's seasons. Like, it's not always going to be like this. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, uh, during the summer, I'm a little bit more flexible. My schedule is a little bit more flexible. I would be a 9 to 10 a.m. workout person if life... Same. Yeah. I would be 10 a.m. every day. That's the sweet spot, and mm-hmm. then I would work out, and I would eat something healthy, and I would take a nap. Mm-hmm. No life. That's what I would do every day. I think the I, I think what a lot of people do too, <clears throat> when they come into street parking, or maybe they're not a member yet and they're listening to this, or just people out in the world, um, if they can't have the per- follow the perfect program, yeah. if they can't do the five days a week at the same time for an hour with the like lifting before the workout, then if they can't do it perfectly, they won't do it at all. Yeah. So this is the 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 75 hard portion of the conversation okay did you do it no oh gosh I don't even know if you remember you did a video I did a post about the 75 hard people were so mad and I had just attempted oh okay and I really was angry right because you couldn't finish it uh because how far into it did you get man I wasn't even like 14 days if you guys are listening to this 75 hard is um by the founder of first forum um, it's like 75 days of, and you have to do all these rules and it's like two workouts a day that are 45 minutes. I think it's like a cold shower reading. Uh, I don't know, it's a, it's a but you're supposed to do it for 75 days straight. And if you mess up, if you miss one thing on one day, you got to start over. Right. Okay. So we were doing, it was during a winter storm when Texas had a really bad winter storm. Yes. Actually, Rachel reached out to me and she was like, you know, I saw you're doing this. Do you really think that's best for you? <laughs> um, and all that. And I think she said you guys had actually had a conversation about it. Uh-huh. And then you put out a video. I was irritated video. about it. Yeah, you put out a video. Because a bunch of members were talking about it right. at the time. And I, I really was a little triggered, you know? And I was you like, were triggered at me? Yeah. And it took me about a day. <laughs> and I was like, you idiot. Once again, another realization. Like, why are you doing this? When you have literally been, the whole time you've been a member of preaching, you don't have to work out twice a day. It doesn't have to be 45 minutes long. You don't have to do all these things. And so... It was like really good to be called out, to be honest with you, because oh, it, it put me in check. I didn't like, just make people mad. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I totally. It was. It's. It's not needed. Right. You want to do it? Cool. But it's exactly. not exactly needed. And what the message was for those of you guys that d- didn't see that post or don't want to go searching for it or whatever, it was not that there's anything wrong with 75 hard, but the right. what I had noticed was the people in the community that were doing it had not yet been consistent with four days a week. 
and you know just simple food you know eating some veggies here and there and drinking some water and four days a week of just the daily workout they would jump from being completely out of it out of consistency to doing that and the message was in reality following a moderate program we i joked i made like a new like 365 moderate moderate. that people still hashtag to this day um of four days a week and eating veggies and getting enough sleep is harder than doing 75 days of like fully focused because anybody can like go hard for 75 days. It's what happens after that. Or can you just live a moderate and fit life your whole life? And I think that that's harder. It's harder to stay in it for the long term than it is to do. And it's not just 75 hard. It's like cleanses or um, whole 30 or any of these, you know, any of these things that people do when they come from, they haven't even laid a foundation of consistency yet yeah because i so. did it again i tried it again recently like I, to support someone and i was like i'm not doing this this is ridiculous i learned my lesson the first time right yeah but that's also the type of personality i have is like well, I can, you know people get people love the like they the challenge of it right. and um like you're saying like just four four or five days a week and and eating some, it's not sexy mm-hmm. like i want to be able to brag about this like hardcore thing I'm doing. I want to feel like a badass. And it's like, well, I think that right. you're a badass if you just do this for years and years and years. Like, that's way more impressive to me. Yeah, what's way impressive to me is all these moms that are working out in their kitchen with their children. Yes. Hanging out. That is so like badass. Stirring the pot and then doing some air squats. Right. They're so much cooler than I will it's ever crazy. be. crazy. Because they have the ability to do that. So mm-hmm. that is impressive to me. Yes, And that's what I've said, too, because, you know, and I feel like I have... Um, the authority to say it because I competed and Julian competed at such a high level. That's more impressive than in a different way, but more impressive to me, people that are consistent and they have no one cheering for them. They don't have sponsors. They don't have potential money. Like they're just doing it so that they can be there for their kids so that they can have a better quality of life so that they can battle their own demons. Like that's so much more impressive to me than people who are professional athletes are they more impressive physically? No, but in a different way, it is more, it's more impressive because nobody's holding their hand and encouraging them and cheering for them. And yep. it, it's self-motivated at yep. completely at that point. Yeah. Um, That's that mental toughness. Yes. That's true mental toughness, right? Yes. There. I mean, because how many athletes yeah. do you see uh, who, I was a college athlete, professional football players, NBA players, whatever, who just completely stop working out once all of that, all of the cheering and all of the sponsorships and all of the coaches calling them to ask them if they're on their way, it's gone. Yep. Yeah. It was all for just that. So if you, yeah, <laughs> I'm glad that it had that yeah. impact on you because that's what, that's what I was going for. It was good. I think but I, I know actually, I triggered a yeah, bunch of people. I thanked you. I thanked you, but I was just a little <laughs> salty for like 24 hours. So. <laughs> good. Well, sometimes yeah. you got to get a little salty. That's how I, that's how you know it worked. That's right. That's right. I was a little bit more sassy before 2020 yeah. and then I got a little scared <laughs> to say anything for a little while, yeah. for sure. Um, well, I think people are going to get so much out of listening to this and there's so much more to your story too. So if you guys don't already follow Leanne, it's Lanny Lifts on IG. She posts a lot and there's oftentimes a very like profound message along with those. Um, and she's very motivating. And Thank you. Her boys are super cute. You yeah. don't post your wife that often, but she's hilarious. Yeah, she won't take a lot of pictures. So I think we have some pictures of her. Yeah, she, we should post those. <laughs> she would love that. And I just want to say thank you. Aww. Like, I really do. I think, you know, when I met you in Vegas and I, I lost my mind, I, but y- you guys and my wife would say it too. This, this saved my life. Like, so thank you so much for that. Well, I don't think that you know how many people in our community that probably feel that way about you and... Any of you guys that were here before, you know, the last few years, I would say you guys built the community. Like, we couldn't have done this without people like you. Um, So thank you back. Yeah, awesome.